where what's going to happen today, I'm first I'm going to introduce the, the panelists. I'm going to ask a few questions and let them respond <coughs> to those questions, and then we're going to turn it over to you. So the last time we did this, you guys had a blue jillion good questions. So we're really excited about having, first of all, you guys <coughs> here today, as well as, as our panelists. So let me introduce our, our panelists. Uh, the first one is Ray Russell. She is a volunteer for San Diego Financial Literacy Center, and she also has her own business called Financial Coach for You. Next to her is Chase Peckham, who is a, uh, the director of Community Outreach and Education. Community Outreach and Education for San Diego Financial Literacy Center. Next to uh, Chase is Paul Lim. You might remember him from the investments talk. He is also a volunteer from San Diego Financial Literacy Center, and he is a certified financial planner with the Wealth Group. And on our uh, end, and our final panelist is Andre De La Mora from California Coast. And so we welcome all of you here, and thank you for coming. So I'm going to give you your first question, and I'll just let you go right down the line. So can you share with us, from your personal experience, one thing that you would encourage individuals to do to jumpstart their financial lives? Wow. Well, I would definitely advise the students to pay themselves first. And then we all have bills to pay. And at the end of the day, who comes first? That's what you are. So basically pay yourself first. If it is $25, $50, put it aside. Because it's going to go a long, long way. I think that's going to be a recurring theme today. Um, pay attention. First thing and foremost, I mean, we live our daily lives. We just kind of get out of bed. We go through our day. We go to sleep at night. And money changes hands, comes in and out. We get paid. We pay for things. And a lot of times we don't pay attention to what we're doing. First thing and foremost is just start the process, is start to understand what's coming in versus what's going out. Paul? Uh, as far as ways to kind of jump start finances here, I just want to let you know that it kind of requires a change of mindset. So I would not only echo all of the things mentioned before me about paying yourself first, but don't look at jump starting your financial life as being something you have to do all at once with a burst of motivation. You know, I know it seems like you need to have this kind of movie montage moment where you get everything turned around in a financial makeover in one weekend, but things don't happen that way in reality. You're much better off to spend an hour a day trying to get better at something as opposed to seven hours all in one day trying to get it all done at once. So if we use that metaphor in the context of finance, I think you start with baby steps. Just don't try and do everything all at once. It's too uh, demoralizing and it seems insurmountable. So get away from that mindset. Instead, give yourself little victories and just do easy things that you know you can do. So some, for example, save fifty dollars per paycheck for one month that's really simple to do it just requires you to go online set it up automatically maybe next month you increase that to 75 and that's a nice little baby step that you have if you make it a goal to cook three meals instead of going out every day to eat that's another little example that you can do but you build these things in slowly so it's not something you have to do all at once in a uh, in a blaze of motivation yeah, I agree with, with what he says. Um, I would say um, utilize the technology that's available right now. Um, apps, we all have them. Look up uh, the top five financial apps that you should download that are free. Those are small tools that you can utilize that will help you with your everyday financial needs and your long-term financial needs. Um, I work at Cal Coast Credit Union. We have an app called Coast Manager. That app has uh, the ability to put all your accounts into one app, and you can view all your balances, all your loan history, all in one app. So it's kind of cool. I would check it every day in the morning and before you go to sleep, just so you could be sound with uh, your finances. Great. So our second question. Uh, we offer a course on personal finance here at Mesa, but what other ways can our, our students and perhaps their friends or their parents um, be able to educate themselves in financial literacy? Um, I would say every one of us have 
these handy dandy tools, right? University of YouTube. I always say, right? Fingertip, yeah, it's at your fingertips. But with all kidding aside, find someone that you can trust and be a me that can be a mentor to you. Someone that has accomplished what you want to accomplish. If it is home buying, is that person a home buyer? Ask them questions. How did you get there? That's the best um, advice that you can get is to see another person and talk to another person and find out how did they get there. If it is, I want to buy this car and this person is driving this car and this person is, you know, um, a mentor of yours, they'll let you know, they'll share the secrets, make sure your credit is straight. What, do, what does that look like? What do I need to do? Ask questions and don't be shy about it. A lot of people would love to pour into you, so having a positive mentor to help you along the way is, is key. Yeah, people you try, I, I'm going to just echo <clears throat> what she said. It, it's, it's, uh, I, I think, and kind of what Paul said on the other side, that, or on the first question that made me think, but it, it's basically making little goal setting for yourself, kind of what it is that you want to accomplish in the short term, and then other things in the long term, little by little, and then talking to the experts in those areas that you want, in those areas that you want to accomplish. Um, whether if it's as simple as finding the right apps and working with somebody like this, or it's talking about long-term strategy on, I'm young, I'm a young professional, I'm just starting out, I'm not sure where, uh, I, I want to start putting money away in different vehicles right now, 401k, how much should it be, how much, what a percentage, of those things. talk to the professionals uh, like that, just depending on what your goals would be. Um, the whole University of YouTube thing is great, but it can be dangerous too, because there's a, anybody can put up a YouTube video. Um, in, again, uh, reinforcing everything that was said already, I would reiterate those items, but then the other thing about the educating yourself and just making this a little bit easier is to put it in the context of a goal. As, as we've mentioned, we've got no shortage of access to information. It's just about where do I start? Where do I begin? It seems so overwhelming. Where do I, where do I begin to actually figure out what I need to learn, first of all? The, attach it to a goal. So if the goal is to say, well, I want to buy a new car, I want to buy a new house, you know, most of the time you're going to actually have to save the dollars from your paycheck every single month in order to build up that savings. And then really what most people want to know is just how do I grow that safely so I don't have to put away as much as I have to. But again, it kind of puts the cart before the horse because you need to have a good job and you need to be able to have that income coming in before any of the knowledge really matters. So I think that putting your priorities in being useful to other people, we're going to reiterate that theme a lot today, because that's what will determine whether or not you have a good paying job. I mean, that's the number one thing you can do. The knowledge will come later. There's no shortage of people out there who can teach you the right way to manage the money. I think, if anything, you just put more of your effort into trying to earn as good of an income as you can, because if you have all the knowledge in the world, but no income against which to save, it's pointless. So anyway, that, that's something I would add. Yeah, I agree. I, I would say get a job, get any job. Work for Uber. Uh, I started working at Long's Drug, it doesn't even exist anymore as a cashier. Uh, making money makes you learn about money, right? And then make friends with the people you work with. Uh, make friends with your managers. Ask them, how did you get here? What would you do differently? Where should I go? Do you have a vision for me? I want to do this. And you know, just talk to the people around you. But first and foremost, get a job, any job. I agree with that. Okay, I'm going to add a caveat to that question because um, I didn't hear any of you reference this, and so I'm curious on your opinion. What about books on personal finance? Um, what about podcasts? What about periodicals? If there are some, I'm sure there are some that are more reliable in your mind than are others. Could you tell us the ones that you are think would be best for us to, to read? Well, okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Let's go in order. Yeah. Okay. So my favorite book that I always refer to is Think and Grow Rich. Think and Grow Rich is a, it's a very powerful book. It was written way back before we were even born, but it has a lot of key ideas that you can apply to your everyday life. And um, take the nuggets and apply it to your life. 
Because knowledge is always powerful, yes. You can get all the knowledge in the world. But the biggest thing is to apply that knowledge in your life. Take that first step okay, and make it your own. Own it. Yeah, I would I would look for the right kind of book of, for some or, or or article that interests you is has is in line with kind of your goals. But if you wanted to go to something that's in text, um, the millionaire next door is <clears throat> still it it was written a long time ago. But the millionaire next door is is a fantastic book if you want to get little tidbits um, on little things that you can do. Uh, everything that was said previously is, is great, of course, but if I want to add just something a little new to this, I would mention that I, don't, I wouldn't look at books necessarily as the end-all, be-all in terms of acquiring knowledge because a book is only good after you've finished it. And so it takes a while to read a book, even if you're really diligent and you sit down with it. So sometimes when you buy a book, you just added something to your to-do list and you just created a new goal for yourself, which is finish the book. And it doesn't really do anything to fix the other problems. So I understand sometimes where that, where that can be a, a nice way to feel like you're making progress because you ordered some book on Amazon. You're saying, okay, I'm getting closer. All you did was you just added new things for your, for your pile. So uh, podcast, that's, a, that's another good one too because you actually, it's easier than reading a book. Actually, you can do it at the gym. You can do it while you're driving and that kind of thing. So I mean, I like Dave Ramsey's show. He's on Kogo sometimes. On he's Sunday. entertaining too. He's good, and he's really good with the basics. I really like that 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 his his approach, and it's it's a nice show. People call in, so if you want to learn a little bit of language, that'll that'll do some things. But you know, remember those mediums. Their primary purpose is entertainment, right? right. So we have to just take that into consideration as well, and just realize that they're. They're there to compel people to buy ads, not necessarily to make you <coughs> as knowledgeable as you're supposed to be. So, yeah, you know, a little bit of everything, but just uh, that's my perspective. Yeah, I mean, books like Rich Dad, Poor Dad, that's always a good one. Um, it's a little cheesy, I'm not going to lie. Um, but, I would, uh, but I would take the main points out of it and utilize it in your lives. Um, but podcasts is just the thing to do right now, like he said. You, you guys are tired of reading books. You guys, what you guys are doing all day. So just pop in a good podcast. A lot of motivational speakers are are not talking about life goals anymore. They're talking about financial goals. So it's a good trend. Yeah, and I think that's if you apply that to life in general, there's not too many things that we do goal oriented wise that doesn't have a financial component to it. Every little thing we do has finances accompanied with it. So you've got to take into a lot of those goals that you set for yourself are going to have little micro goals to accomplish that goal. So we're, as Paul kind of mentioned, you're going to be constantly adding little goals to yourselves. If it's a matter of here, how do I make that work? And, and a lot of times the financial side is just going to come. You have to kind of take into what it is. Read, follow the kind of things that has something to do with your goal. Reading a whole book of The Millionaire Next Door may not accomplish what you want in that short term, but the overall principles that you might live the rest of your life with could be within the pages of those books. And another thing with reading books, I don't read a book from cover to cover. I go in and I scheme. I look at the table of contents and I was like, you know what? I want to get information on that. And that's what I focus on. So don't feel like when you get a book in front of you, you have to read it from cover to cover. You look through and see what areas that jump out at you and have at it. Except for your textbooks. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We don't good. go to college anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. Can you share one thing from your personal financial life that if you could do it all over again, what would it be and how would you do it? Can I go back in time though? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, one thing I knew, okay, I joined the military at a very young age, right out of high school. And if I could do it again, I would say put aside at least $100 a month or pay period. Pay period because we got paid twice a month. And at that time, I didn't have any kids. I was young. Didn't know nothing about money. All I know is you make money to spend it. And that's what I did. I spent money crazy. I bought things that just because. You know, I got a credit card just because. And if I could do things again, Howard, I would say I put aside $200 a month because I spent 13 years in the military, okay? When I left the military, I should have had hundreds of thousands of dollars. So that's what I would have done differently. I was gonna say just one. We could do a whole panel on the mistakes that I made. 
uh, I would have learned what the tool of a credit card was. I, I, I would have learned how to use it. Um, as a youngster, I got myself, I was $26,000 in credit card debt by the time I was 26 years old. Um, started in college. Started, got my first one my freshman year, graduated with five of them. Thought they were the greatest things in the world. I can use them like crazy. Don't have to pay them back right away. How do these people make any money? Uh, and believe it or not, I was a real, relatively well-educated kid, but I didn't realize how dumb I was. Uh, I, would, I would realize that you can use these products that these banks and, and credit unions have uh, to your advantage if you learn how to use them correctly, like building credit and doing those kinds of things, and you don't have to go into debt for them. Um, believe me, the, the fun I had leading up to that debt wasn't nearly, nearly worth the eight and a half years it took me to pay it off. Uh, I think it's important maybe when we're looking back as far as mistakes made in the past and this just reframing them. You know, I, I don't think that I would necessarily go back and redo everything because some of the mistakes that you make are part of what define your character and they're some of the best lessons that are out there because you really do remember them because they're painful. But I understand the nature of the question and really what it's asking is what do you know now that you maybe wish you could have told yourself back and, yep. and so I understand what, what what the purpose of it is and I'll say that if I were just getting out of college and I wanted to work for the very least amount of effort and get the most amount of pay, uh, the, the, the place to go would be like a public entity. I was really shocked at how different it is in the private sector versus the public sector. It's very easy to understand. If you run a private company, you have to have a good or a service that you sell and then be able to charge more for it than it costs you to provide that service and then whatever's left, well, that's what you use to pay yourself or expand or do other things. And in public entities and government, it doesn't work that way. They just get their money given to them for the taxpayer. They don't sell anything. They don't have a product or service to sell. It's just appropriated. And then their budget grows every single year. And so it becomes no wonder why we see cities in California like Stockton going bankrupt because their pension system is just ridiculous. And so whenever you give a bunch of people money that they didn't earn themselves through their own hard work, they're going to spend it in a wasteful way. And actually, if they don't spend all the money that they're given, their budget gets cut the next year. So you actually see them rushing to spend all their money in their budget before the fiscal year ends so that their budget doesn't get cut. So they literally waste money on purpose. And part of the way is they'll, they'll give themselves lavish pensions and uh, compensation. I have friends in the federal government, they get every other Friday off, and I was just shocked at the way that that works. So that was a big eye-opening lesson to me, and I think that I thought very differently uh, back there. And that, I would say that was one of the biggest lessons that I'd ever learned, but I, I, I see even when working with clients, the only people that really get to retire in their early 50s are people who either sell their business for a huge lump sum or they work for the government. It's kind of amazing the way that that works out. So if any of you are interested in that path, it's the, the Illinois Coast, you know, I, I would look at it. Would that might it. be the single greatest answer I've ever heard. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to get a little bit more basic and just, and I'm going to say who has their own car already or who, okay. I would say refinance your car because the chances are that you got a really high rate or um, a rate that's not as low as you could get. Um, save money now by refinancing your car. Just go to a credit union like California Coast Credit Union and refinance your car. So when I first got my first car, I was excited just to get my 2008 Altima finance from the dealer. I was getting a interest rate at 8%. And I thought that was good, you know, my payments were fairly easy to make because I was working at Long's Drugs. But then I never knew that I could refinance that car into a lower rate. And I didn't know that there were interest rates that are close to 1% or 2%. So I would, I would just hone in on something that you could specifically do right now today and change, you know. Refinance your car or do a, a balance transfer on your credit card. You're paying a 25% interest rate on your credit card. Transfer that balance into another credit card that has a, a lower interest rate. Okay. Where is the best place to put your money? That's a loaded question. Um, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, I would say this is where you want to get the professionals to help you 
if you do not know. I know a lot of times uh, when I speak with, with clients one-on-one, -on -one, um, and, and, and the question is, where do you save your money? Um, you, you save it for retirement in vehicles that's paying you point something percent. That's not gonna grow. You wanna put your money where it's gonna grow, where it's gonna make money for you. Because at the end of the day, your money doesn't ask for vacations, your money doesn't ask for sick time, your money doesn't ask for a day off. You want your money to work for you, rather than you working so hard for your money all these years, right? So do your research, find people that you can trust, find the professionals that are licensed to sit down with you and to help you with that game plan. Because there are places where you can get your money to truly work for you. It's a really open-ended question uh, as well. I mean, it could be where do you put your money into a credit union or a bank, or um, where do you invest your money, or what do you do with your retirement, and what vehicle do you put it in? And the answer for me, there, there really is no answer based on, depends on who you are, where you are in your life, and those kinds of things. Um, you know, is a credit union better for you? It might be. Is a bank better for you? It might be depending on what, where you are in your, in your life. Um, but there are, you know, there are so many different options out there to do different things. I've got my family just as an, ex as an example. We've got money in many different places for many different reasons. And we have people like Paul that help guide us through that process for everything from college saving for our kids to retirement at a certain age for the both of us. And hopefully it's by 50 something. But it's not, it's not the pension that's going to get me there. It's the due diligence that my wife and I do at, a, at, a, at a, starting very early in our lives. Um, so it's a really difficult question to answer without spe specificities. And even then, um, I don't even think that can be answered. True. Uh, I'm actually going to give a technical answer to this question here. So first thing you're going to do is uh, checking savings account, cash reserve, three months of your living expenses. The point of this is to test yourself, to see if you can save. If you can actually achieve three months worth of your living expenses in just boring cash, then that makes you a good candidate to save into some of the more advanced accounts where maybe the money's locked up for a little bit and you can't grab it in case of an emergency. So usually place number two is an employer's retirement plan, whether it's 401k or TSP or 403b or any of those, usually that's a great next place to go because you'll get a tax deduction, more details on that in the tax class, but then also you'll get an employer match most of the go. time where you instantly get a doubling of your money or 50% on your money, and that becomes very encouraging, which as we know, success begets more success and good positive uh, feelings coming as a result of seeing your money instantly double the moment it hits the account is a very good thing. So I usually say next, the employer-sponsored plan. If you're really good and you're putting in everything you can into your employer's plan to take their match, maybe you look towards a uh, non-retirement investment account. They're called brokerage accounts, things of that nature. You can actually utilize investments but touch the money before 59 and a half if you open up a non-retirement investment account. And that's usually the next place people like to go because they want to save for a house or home or wedding or whatever it is, and they'd, they'd like to do that before they're 59 and a half years old. So that's something else to consider as far as the way goes. But you know, when you're, when you're first doing some of the cash reserve items, I wouldn't scrutinize too much about the details here and there. California Coast has some great rates, I'm sure, that they can help you with some of those instruments. But really, that first step is just a test to see if you can do it. Because if you start to build up a couple thousand and then all of a sudden you have an emergency and you consume the 2,000, well, I'm glad that was in a checking account, not in some 401k where you'd pay a large penalty for taking it out. So that's the order, I would say. So we're like on question four and five, right, in between. I moved you down to number five. Number five. Okay. okay, well, obviously I would say put your money in a credit union. Uh, the reason I say that is because when you become a member of the credit union, you technically you own part of the credit union. So uh, everybody knows what a checking and savings is. Each checking is a share. So you own that share in the credit union. So basically how it works is that you pay a small membership fee to enter the credit union. And it's kind of like Costco. So you're a member now and you can take advantage of the really low rates uh, and free money that we give out. Um, 
it, I would say always go with the credit union, 100%. Especially the credit union that works with your school. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next question. The holiday season is a fast approaching. And I know my students are already asking me what I want for Christmas. <laughs> so can you tell them what are the do's and don'ts of holidays? Um, Black Friday, stay away from Black Friday. <laughs> I know a lot of people go out there without a game plan. You go out there and it's like going into Walmart for a couple things. I mean, out of Walmart with shopping carts full of things that you had no idea you were going to buy. It's um, sticking with your goals, sticking with your budget. Um, going to shop with just the money that you are going to spend. Because <laughs> these stores have a way of pulling your money out of your pocketbooks. Because of things like buy one, get one free, 50% off here. Don't take your nieces and nephews with you to go shopping. If you have kids, keep them at home. Because that pressure is going to be upon you. Mom, Dad, uh, Auntie, Uncle, remember I want this toy. And you're like, oh my gosh. And you're going to get caught up in that rush. I do not go out on Black Friday. I stay in. And I watch on TV how people go crazy. Just to get that television because it's $50 or $25 for a couple hours. So, you know, have a plan in place. Stick with your plan. And um, I always say, if you want to plan for Christmas, start, start saving in January. You know, buy things after Christmas for the holidays. Everything is on sale. Don't just wait for the day before and get that mad rush. Now you're compelled to buy everyone in your family gifts. I shop at 99 cent stores. Yes, I do. I put together things. And it's not about what you give them. It's the thought that's behind it. Okay? Rest my case. Drop the mic. <laughs> I got nothing to add. That was pretty good. Just take the emotion out of it. I got to I gotta buy a gift for every single one of my family members and friends and so on and so forth. You know, I mean, I say this all the time and I work with people all the time on a, on a different level, but uh, when it comes to like church and things like that where they'll give and they give, they want to give to their church so badly, but the, in spite of the fact they can't pay their own rent, they'll still give $100 a month to their church. And I love the fact that they're doing that, but the mere fact is your church isn't going to want you to not be able to pay your rent either. So getting a little bit off, it's the same thing when it comes to the holidays. We all get into that type of mode where, let's face it, I'm, I mean, money, is, it's emotional. We, we do a lot of things based on emotion. Um, and, and some of us are a little bit more emotional than others. Um, so you just need to know the kind of person you are. And she already said it, plan it out. Uh, just to add another perspective on this, I think that the, really the purpose of the holidays being at the end of the year is to celebrate your successes that you've made throughout the first 10 months or so. So I think the best way for you to enjoy the holidays is just to leave all your effort on the field and don't, don't hold back and just you know try and make as much as you can and, and uh, be able to hit as many of your goals as possible so you can relax and take it easy and celebrate all the achievements that you had to this point. And so, it, it also comes with being realistic as well too. So if you didn't hit some of the goals that you wanted to, maybe you don't get to spend as much as you had before and at that time you don't necessarily beat yourself up about it, but it's a time for reflection about what maybe you can do differently next year, but then also to still celebrate the wins that you had throughout this year, otherwise the holidays don't become enjoyable. It even goes back to things like fitness, and some people will beat themselves up for overeating during time, but just get that done like now and still have a balance during those times and spend a little bit of time to reward yourself and actually enjoy and have fun and not take things so, so seriously because I think the way we talk to ourselves is very important. So the way that people speak in their own minds, the thoughts that you have in here, this is like the most important thing that you can ever work on, on anything. The people who continuously think uh, uh, good things and, and are being able to be optimistic about the way things are going forward, they'll tend to have better results because just their, their actions will change through uh, altering their thoughts. So I, I don't want you to go into the holiday season feeling guilty and, and, and necessarily being in a scarcity mode because that will defeat the purpose of what that whole season is about. So, it's about having a little bit of both, but just try your hardest all throughout the year so you can relax and take it easy 
during these times. And I think that if you're not feeling that way this year, you use that as motivation to say, okay, I don't want to feel like this again in a year. Why don't I just really ramp up 2018 so that 365 days from now, it'll be the way I envision it. So, it's a thought. Yeah, I mean, I agree with what you're saying. Um, I would say if you don't have a plan or a budget set for the holidays, don't spend more than 15% of your monthly income. And if you do want to start doing a budget or a plan, start in January. So every month or every paycheck, save a little bit of money to spend for your holidays. If you don't have that, don't spend over 15% of your monthly income. And see if you can make it work. See if you could extend that money to all the people you need to cover. You know? And if you need a sacrifice on yourself, you don't need all the things that you think you need. Okay. So there's been a lot of talk in California about a million more homes, a million more jobs. Um, a lot of our students are out there in the getting ready to either transfer, some of them are getting ready to go into the workforce. What do you see on the horizon for uh, the economics uh, for the country? And should we be concerned? Um, I would say we all need to be concerned and not just get in our comfort zone that it doesn't affect us and it's always about someone else somewhere out, out there. We should always be concerned because when I die, I leave my family behind. I leave my, my daughter behind. They have to fend. They have to know. And so get as much information as you can. Don't turn off the television. Look and see what's going on around, not just here in America, but globally. Because everything ties in. Everything has an impact. And uh, you cannot say I did not know, because we have information highway right on our fingertips. Okay, And so always keep in tune. Get involved with, with local community groups. See what's going on. How can I give back? Instead of just take, 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 how can I be uh, uh, someone that's really you know, making things happen, making things move? Because you're in a position here where you're seeing things happen, and you have to, make, you have to come up with the changes. You have to come up with the ideas on how can we fix what folks that have messed up in the past left us. Now we have things that we have to focus on getting, getting done right. So we're hoping that your generation will be the generation to get in there and make some positive changes uh, so that we can survive. Your future, your children, your grandchildren can survive here. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> if you look at history, period, there's going to be economic ups, there's going to be economic, um, economic downs. What I think that people can do the best is rely on yourself to be productive in your life. Don't rely on other people to help make your life better. You, whatever path that you want to take, use those resources and those people around you to help make you make better decisions. But ultimately, if we all strove and worked harder and got to the places where we wanted to be to contribute, economically, we would be a very good engine, right? It would work, if all parts are working, that engine, that car is gonna move better, right? So if, if, for me, again, without getting too political, you just work, control what you can control, do what you can do, follow and try to do the goals and, 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 and accomplish those goals that you want to do what it is you wanna do to become a, 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 a a part of the economic engine, become part of this, become part, become part of the solution to making well a, a better place. I mean, th those principles will tend to survive the ups and downs. So, as far as future economic standpoint goes, I think that the thing that is on a lot of people's minds is automation, and I think that sure. certain people should be concerned, not necessarily everybody. So, automation will really let the people do much more in a much quicker amount of time and at lower cost, so in a way that's a good thing, but then again, all the people that used to do those jobs will no longer have them. So I think that one of the things you need to really think about, if I were in the college student's shoes right now, is to think about ways for you to have a job that can't be taken away from you. And I'll give you some examples here. It's important to really internalize a lesson that the wage you're paid is a function of how useful you are to other people. 
we don't pay you a wage because it's the nice thing to do or because every person deserves a living wage and all this. That's false. That's not true. And so you hear all these people come out and they're saying, well, we'll just fix all the problems if we raise the minimum wage. But see, that won't work because otherwise all the people who make less than the minimum wage right now after it's artificially inflated, so like the EMTs and the hospital workers and all the call center representatives and all the creators at Walmart, they're all going to realize that they can take an easier job and make more money. And so all those people will be displaced from their jobs who used to be in them before, just as an example. And then eventually some accountant's going to come up and say, you know what, it's cheaper for me just to have a touch screen and do it this way than paying some human person $15 an hour. It's just an example for you to think about. But if you are in an industry where your skills cannot be automated, then you'll be safe from any of those things happening. I'll give you an example of something that you can't automate. Soft skills, people skills, being able to talk with others and make deals happen and negotiate and to be able to talk with people in a way that is making them feel comfortable about doing business with you and, and those kinds of things. Um, dealing with angry customers and doing customer service, such an important skill. And I know we talked before about having jobs and being able to learn things from even what seems like menial tasks. So, Work is not drudgery. That's not necessarily how you should see it. You can take an entry-level position and learn so many life lessons from those things, even if it's just dealing with nasty people who are being unreasonable. I'll tell you right now, I'm the master of breaking bad news to people. If I want to, somebody to like realize something, I've got a way to say it. It's not fun when you do it, but a computer can never replace me in that way. Have you ever seen somebody be calm down when they call an automated phone tree. They get enraged at things like that. Computers enrage people if they don't work like a human being. And so that's an example of a tough job that you could have. If you're with your boss and you're doing tough things for your boss, like dealing with angry people or being able to help someone actually feel compelled to purchase a product or service from that company. That is huge, and they will always pay you more for doing that You're because, so valuable. yeah, I can't outsource that to a third world country. I can't make a computer program that does that for me. This is something that will always be in demand because humans are humans, and people are going to be people in the future. And so just think a little bit more about the kind of job that you're having and think to yourself, how hard is this to do? Would it be easy for just some company to replace me someday because I'm an inconvenience or become too expensive over time? Or is my, is my function so invaluable to the point where they're never going to be able to get rid of me or else I go somewhere else? So that's what I think I would, I would put as far as lessons right now. Great example of that is I had a friend that just changed her whole direct life because she always wanted to help people and she's at 33 years old going back to school to become a nurse. And I said, what made you think to do that? And she said, because no matter how much technology goes forward, and they can fix and do cancers and everything else, human beings are still going to be sick, and they still want their hands held, and they still want to be talked to, to, talked to, and they still want to be comforted. You can't do that with a machine that takes a, a human touch to help people get through those things, even as technology goes on. You can't replace that human element. Yeah, and um, machines can't innovate. You know, we can. We, we, we invented the computer, right? So be, in, be innovative, but we should be concerned. You know why? Because there's peoples and communities that choose things for us that we, we really don't have a control over. You know, that's the society we live in. But they can't choose and control the way you innovate and your work ethic, right? So you have to know how to work within the system, but always acknowledge that there is a system out there. Yeah, there is a system in place. People make decisions for you that you can't really do anything about. But they can't control who you are and how hard you work and how hard you innovate. Okay. So those are the questions we had for the panel. It's now your turn. So if you have any questions for the panel, just let us raise your hand, ask them, and you'll get some uh, great responses, I'm sure. Um, my question is for the whole panel. Um, so, over the course, because I've attended every single one, and over the course of, of all of the speaker series, I'm catching on that you mention a lot of indirect skills that will help you financially plan. So, um, just the same way that Paul mentioned that customer service is important and it will build your foundation for the rest of your career. Um, 
what are some little things that you feel that you didn't think were going to help you be, uh, I guess, more financially literate um, over, over the course of your lifetime? Well, with me, some of the little things I didn't think, the school of hard knocks is making the mistakes and then learning from the mistakes and not only um, relying on someone else telling me what to do, but me actually doing the research on my own has led me down that path to know more, to where I'm getting, uh, you know, to get my license, to now start my own company, to give that human touch to people rather than just send them to an automated um, computer, you know. So it's in that coaching field that I find myself, you know, just right there. This is my passion. It's not a job anymore. It's not what's paying the bills. It's what I truly am. Is a coach. You know, and, and my passion goes through. I go home at night and still work on plans for families past midnight. They're like, you're crazy. Well, it's passion. A job can do that. You clock in and you clock out. But a passion is working with people and holding that hand and meeting them where they're at and being able to be a resource unto them. So, then from the school of hot knocks. Definition of insanity is what? <laughs> Doing the same thing over and over. And expecting a different sure. result? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> couldn't have said it any better. I mean, that's the thing is we're all going to make mistakes. It's the people that learn from them the quickest that, have, that, are, uh, that are the strongest um, and come out. Uh, I, I think even all the most well-intentioned decisions that we make, and, and it may not work out, but it's being perseverant in knowing that there's a foundation of right and wrong and keep trying. You know, the SDFLC, we talk about roadmaps all the time because um, you know, life is one big journey, right? And if you're going on a road trip, there's many different ways to get to your ultimate destination, right? And some ways are going to go real good, and sometimes you're going to run into a storm, and roads are going to be washed out, and you're going to have to go take a detour to get wherever you need to go. Um, perseverance, um, I think, and believing in yourself, and that the, that the steps that you're taking are the right ones. And, and you usually know. And what I mean by that is we all have that little person in the back of our mind or on our shoulder that tells us exactly what we're supposed to do, whether we listen to it or not. I'm going to talk about maybe two things that are of importance. I think the first one is going to be uh, language and about how communication so, so important, even though maybe it's not emphasized as much in some of the more technical fields. And then the number two thing is, why do we learn about the way the world works and business and things of that nature? So when it comes to the communication, the verbal communication, it's, it's really important for you to really be thinking about the words that you actually use when you're speaking to somebody. So I think the, you know, the big trend in a lot of ways for young people is to use a lot of slang and jargon and, and casual language. And I'm just going to tell you that's going to really hurt you in the business world. So if you can make habits, and habits are very important, as I talked to you before, uh, not only about the way you think, but if you think using those words, you're going to speak using those words. So you've got to think a little differently and use different language. I think a good way to start is an exercise uh, eliminating idioms. That was a really big thing for me in terms of being able to communicate more effectively. Because if I say, Oh, I'm beating a dead horse. We all kind of understand what that means, but if you talk to someone with English as a second language, they're having no idea. You should be like, why are you talking about a horse right now? So, so if you think about eliminating phrases like that, you can say idioms are kind of like intellectual laziness. You're, you're eliminating the use of some other words that you might need to form your thoughts, but if you get rid of those, you're going to find that you can speak to more people. It's going to be less confusing when you try to get an idea across. And, and people are going to listen to you more. Uh, just being grammatically correct and, and having prepositions at the end of sentences, that makes you sound really not uh, like you have your uh, uh, things together, as I just said right now. But in any case, <laughs> the whole idea is just, just be cognizant of that and make it an exercise and, and, and just look at it like strength training and just think about the way that people speak when, when, they're, when, they're, when they're grammatically correct and other things. So very important. And I think a good place to start is that. Second thing is, is you know, learning about business, I think, is important to the extent that you can understand how your company makes money. So the whole point of understanding the way that taxation works and the way that business cycle happens and things like that is so that you can understand the incentives of your company. And then that becomes easier for you to say to yourself, 
what are the things I need to do in order to become super valuable at work? Because if you go work for a company and you have no idea how they make money, you're not going to be knowing at all what's useful in your duties and what's not useful in your duties. And so you can let the, the useless stuff kind of go to the side for a little bit if you maniacally focus on the things that are really important. And so I think it's uh, you know, a crucial lesson for you to just know a little bit about why a corporation is taxed at a separate rate and, and why they're concerned about retained earnings and all these kinds of things. And reading little news stories can help you out with things like that. You know, one of the people, they'll ask me, like, how come GE and IBM pay zero corporate tax and they're huge? I just don't understand. That's not fair. We have to change the laws. And that's not, that's not the way you look at it. There's something called retained earnings, where if I make a million bucks and I have 800000 in costs and I have $200,000 left, I actually pay 35% on this, so I see 70 grand right at the window, and then I see $130,000 left, and then I pay it out to a person, and it's taxed again. So they talk about this double taxation thing. So IBM and GE are smart, so what they do is they say, let's just spend this $200,000. So I have zero times 35%, so they just pay it out as bonuses, or they buy a bunch of equipment all in one year, so they search zero profit. Zero times 35 is nothing, and then I'm already going to have to pay tax when I pay that out anyway, so... That's why they pay zero and corporate tax. And they're benefiting tax. their people, too. That's right. And so if you don't know that, then hearing that headline or that news story is going to seem shocking to you, and you're going to come to this conclusion. But after you look at it, you go, that totally makes sense. And then if you worked for that company... You'd be very happy. Yeah, and then you could even go to them and, and find ways for them to expense things before fiscal year end is over. And you can say, I've got a good idea. I think we have to get um, you know, vision benefits for everybody. Here's how much it costs, and it's a great way to eat up costs. And they'll say, oh, good idea. And then you just got vision benefits for everybody, for example. And, and you wouldn't have thought that that was something they wanted unless you knew how the system worked. So that's an example, right? So anyway, those are things that I think that I realize now that maybe weren't as emphasized so hard in school, for sure. I think a small financial tip is, sounds weird, but clean your room. <clears throat> Why? Because it, it teaches you to organize yourself. And then you realize how much all these things cost and how much you're not taking care of them and how you are taking care of them. So in the beginning of the day, make sure you always clean your room. Because you have a laptop, right, that costs money. Why is it on the floor? It should be on my desk, right? These shoes, why are they in the, why are they in the front? I should have them in the cupboard where they should be. It teaches you on, uh, on how to be organized, and it teaches you how to value what you spend your money on. Just small tips like that. Can you come talk to my daughter, please? Yeah, I, need to, I know. I mean, I need to talk to myself. I need to talk to myself sometimes. You know? I want to do a real quick follow-up on that question, and then uh, we'll wrap it up. Uh, Paul, you talked about using correct grammar uh, having an improved and expansive vocabulary. As a student, how do we do that? You gotta read. Sometimes if I, if I have somebody and if I talk to them and they're scatterbrained and all over the place and they don't have complete sentences and they jump from here to there, I can, I can say, this person doesn't read. So that's, that's kind of one thing that will jump out at me, number one. And you don't have to read hard material. Honestly, if you just look at something that is enjoyable to you, even fiction, you can learn a lot from reading fiction, too. It's just the exercise of seeing how sentences are constructed. And if you think more in literary terms because you're inputting that into yourself, you're going to think differently, too. And so I, I know we're all kind of looking for a fast tip that we can all take away, because that's all we'll, we'll remember anyway. So I'll give you one, one tip. Um, don't end sentences with prepositions, right? So uh, there was the funniest comic I'd ever seen before. It was so funny. It was this grammar wizard, and he's, he's going to all these kids' shows, and he's like, oh, he's like, kids, you, you have skills that even I'm impressed with. And all the kids go to him, and they go, did you just end a sentence with a preposition? And it was just so funny because they attack him. You can't have like a, a two object not having something. And people, people say this all the time. I'm trying to think of good examples. Um, uh, I can't right now, but basically like four, two, uh, okay, four, four, who, um, oh, who is this lunch for? That's a, that's a bad sentence, right? That's an example. And, and people say it all the time. It's like, who is this for? Who, who is this lunch for in, in over here? And, and you can't end a sentence that way because it's like the four wants another 
the word behind it. Right. And so the actual grammatically correct thing to say is, uh, you know, for whom was this lunch prepared, right? And it makes you sound like Shakespeare, right? But that's actually the right way to go about doing things. But maybe there's a way to rephrase that question so you don't ask it in that way and you don't set yourself up to sound silly at the end. And people do it all the time because it's colloquial, right? Oh, colloquial is a word that means it's just something people say, right? But if you start to try and coach yourself so you don't do that and um, you're able to use things correctly, uh, it, it'll go a long way to make you sounding older and, and a little bit more worldly. I don't know if that's the right way to put it necessarily, but that's, that's a good example, I think. If you guys can just examine, just go through life and, and observe how many people do that. And I don't think they even do it on purpose. I don't even think they realize what they're doing, but that, that was a big game changer as far as how I started to construct sentences in my mind. How many of you are uncomfortable speaking in front of a class or getting involved in discussions and those kinds of things? Oh, yeah, like so if, if you, you want to be, you sit in the back of the class and you're hoping you don't get called on, that kind of thing. One thing I can tell you skills wise, if you, that, that will help you reading, but and we, especially in today's world where we're constantly this and we text everything and you know, God forbid, actually use the phone, it's called a phone, we, we talk on it, right? Oh, why would I call you if I can text you? But <coughs> communications between human beings, if you're uncomfortable in college or at this stage, you're going to have to eventually work through that because you're going to have to interview. You're going to have to make, you're going to sell your, you know, people say I'm not a good salesman. Well, you, you better try because you're going to be selling yourself for the rest of your life, right? So if you can kind of try to get out of that comfort zone or that uncomfortable zone and try to, Use this ability in college when you have the opportunity to, to speak and try those things because that's going to help you dramatically throughout your careers and your life and meeting people when you're dating. It's just, I mean, were you always really good at speaking for a living? Oh, yeah, I was born speaking. Yeah, I <laughs> You know, but those are the kind of skills that will never go away. You know, you can't hide behind a computer for everything. There might be a few of those jobs, but for the most part, you still have to interview with the person to get those jobs. That's a really good point. That's a skill I forgot to mention is, is the importance of not using written communication as a crutch. Because some people think to themselves, well, if I have unlimited time to formulate my text, I'll think of the perfect thing to say. And, oh. blah, 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 and they agonize over it, right? I get everything done on the phone. Yes. I, just, I love the phone because things get done. Yes. You know, if you, if you realize, Hallelujah. hey, let, let's meet for lunch. <laughs> Where do you want to go? Over here. Okay, great. That's a three minute phone call and we have something done as opposed to a volley of 12 texts back and forth about where we want to go, what time you want to meet, it's, it's such a waste, right? So you get so much more done on the phone, but in the context of business, the phone is so much more powerful too because you get to use the on-the-spot nature of the conversation to your advantage. And so when I ask someone a question, I'm going to get their gut reaction right at that moment. And then I say to myself, if they say this, I'm going to say this. If they say this, I'm going to say that. And so you get to plan that out. It makes you quick and it gives you the ability to think fast. If you send someone an email, it might be uh, two or three days. Four yeah, days. two, three, four, forty-eight hours, and that's acceptable in the business world. So someone to just ruminate on it and then just game plan out every single thing they're going to say and proofread it a million times. Things get done so slowly that way, and you lose the advantage of the spontaneity in that moment. Oh, so yeah. you just call someone, you get it done on the phone. And so if you have bad phone skills, you're never going to be able to be good at those yes. things, and uh, you might feel as though oh, I'm being manipulative, I'm being intrusive, I'm being a little too dominant when I'm on the phone. It's not. You're being assertive and you're actually leading and you're actually getting things done and you're actually moving forward with progress so we don't drag this thing out on our to-do list for seven business days. We get it done right now. Great example. I work, these are two of my top volunteers. They have jobs outside of volunteering for my organization. I send them an email and it's important to me, right? I have to have you guys set up, you're going to be somewhere at a certain date. To me, I'm thinking they're going to respond super fast, but they don't. Their lives don't revolve around my email. They've got jobs to do. They've got clients they're talking to. They've got all these things. So to them, they're going. I'll get to that when I can get to that. If I phone call them, if I get a call, they know. Oh, it's Chase. This must be important. And it drives me crazy because I see people in my office all the time. I'll say, Did you talk to somebody? And they'll say, Well, I sent them an email. How long ago? Three days ago. A lot can happen in three days, right? So it's a matter of, if I need something from Paul, 
I'll give him a call, I leave him a voicemail, he knows I need to get back to Chase, he'll put it a little bit different priority. It just, people think that the written communication is, if I do that, that's, that's it. Not necessarily. And I'm glad you did bring that up because I was going to say the different forms of communication that you can rely on. Don't just rely on one. That's right. Because you got to figure out what yes, is sir. that person's means of communication, right? Because sometimes you might be in the class and you, you get a phone call. Like, like I just got a couple phone calls. On my voicemail message, I said, if you need to get a hold of me right away, text me. That's just on my voicemail. That's mm -hmm. just my preferred way of getting in contact with Coach Ray because I don't have time to check a voicemail. I really don't. <laughs> And so, or check your emails all exactly. the time. And yeah. So you got to find out what that person's you know primary for um, communication <laughs> is, and don't just rely on one thing. Because Paul might call me, and he'll get a phone call. See, she picks up though. There are some people who are sometimes I'm just calling and they're scared to have a verbal conversation. Pick up your phone. It's <laughs> <laughs> just funny, right? Don't be afraid of the phone. It's so don't helpful. Don't be afraid of it. That's right. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna have one last tip to that, and then we're gonna wrap it up. As far as building your vocabulary, if you, what most people tend to do is they'll read and they'll find a word that they don't understand or can't pronunciate or un know the definition of and they skim right by it. So what you need to do is stop. Yep, look it up. Look up the word, look up the pronunciation, Write it in your textbook or write it in the book. I mean, even in books that I read that are nonfiction, I do this. And then I make myself use that word four to five times in sentences during the week. What am I doing? I'm putting it in my vocabulary. And then I can use it, and it's a part of my arsenal. And when I'm going out and I'm communicating, I don't have to use this basic, basic level English. I can use multi-syllable words. <laughs> <laughs> and believe it or not, Paul hit that uh, right on the head. That's exactly when I use when I was in industry and I interviewed individuals. Your vocabulary was important because if First you impression. couldn't speak the language and you couldn't mm -hmm. use big words. That told me something about your education level. Okay. Yeah, you can't look people in the eye. If you have a hard time, you look away because you're just uncomfortable. You, that is a skill, whether you're comfortable with it or not, you need to have. First impressions, if I'm interviewing somebody, they're looking me in the eye and they're assertive and they're comfortable. They, they look like they're together. If they're, that just shows me that I'm not so sure. Yeah, some other exercises here. Try and come up with lots of synonyms, so try and figure out what are five different ways I can say this same thought. And that's a really good way because you'll hear this all the time when you go to any of these public events where some mayor is speaking or the city council person is speaking. And they'll say the word community over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. like, for our community, 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 community. You just hear it over and over again. I'm like, I wish they would figure out another word so that maybe you don't repeat it in as many sentences all the time. And I try not to use the same word twice in a sentence. It just sounds awkward. And just try and find other ways to say things so that you can be a little bit more versatile and, and more descriptive, too. Because you know, the English language is it's, it's amazing. There's so many different ways to say the same thing. And you, you compare that to even some Asian languages, for example. And there's like one way to say you're happy. And there's like two ways to say you're happy. I mean, sometimes. And you've got to use a lot of inference and context here with the English language, there's like 12 different ways to say things, and it's such a waste for you to just use the one little thing over and over again. I, I'll tell you this one story, you'll remember. Uh, the only billionaire I've ever met, he told a story one time to this group of guys, he was like, I hate the way you speak, and he goes, you, you just say everything's awesome, everything's awesome, this is awesome, this is awesome. He goes, that's such a lazy way to describe something that is incredibly magnificent, he goes, the aurora borealis at the end of night. He goes, that is an awesome sight because you're in awe of it, right? He goes, being able to see the top of a volcano while you're in a helicopter looking down, he goes, that is an awesome sight. He goes, but for you to just say, oh, this, this bean burrito is awesome. He goes, that's the most ridiculous waste of that word. And it's so not the way to, to, to use it. So that is awesome. <laughs> so again, it, it's about reframing the, the words you select and being more descriptive because if you say that, it loses all of its meaning and, and you're not going to, no one's going to take you seriously when you actually use it for an apt situation. Well, I think it, it depends on the bean burrito. <laughs> That's true. 
<laughs> That's a good point. Okay. Well, first of all, I want to uh, please thank our panelists.